Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're here uh, for uh, week eight, and uh, we're going to be doing uh, for the osteotomy course. Um, to remind everyone, myself and uh, Brett Christ are the chairs, and we're doing week eight. This is the discussion group on periarticular um, periarticular knee deformities and doing osteotomies around the knee. Um, what we're going to do today is uh, discuss some cases, but I want to remind everybody about the live event that will occur uh, sometime in, uh, in the fall uh, in Las Vegas, where we hope that you can use some of the uh, new techniques that you've uh, learned uh, during this uh, course. So uh, all your microphones have been muted and your videos are off. Um, try to send in your questions through uh, I think it's going to be through chat this time, not through question and answer, because I don't believe we have the question and answer. We have the, the chat uh, link. Um, and so we'll be able to, to answer some of your questions. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure we get to all of them. For this uh, format today, we have faculty presenting their own cases. Our thought is, is that they will run through their thought process and their concerns of what they wanted to accomplish. And our panel will be discussing other options from other perspectives. I put here some constructive criticism so that people will be able to um, let us uh, get an insight into what their types of thought process is. So we're gonna have uh, six different people hopefully present cases today. And we have some other distinguished faculty members that are all going to give us a hand asking questions and, and helping us guide through, uh, guide through the cases. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Tim Weber uh, and Tim's going to take us through his uh, first case. Okay, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> um, so this gentleman is a 14 year old, uh, was uh, motocross racer and uh, had an accident, a knee injury, ended up with this uh, physeal bar uh, that we see uh, here on the uh, uh, lateral side of his epiphysis. There was an attempt at trying to remove the uh, physeal bar, uh, but unfortunately was unsuccessful. Um, and he uh, then <clears throat> ends up uh, roughly about two years later, uh, with this deformity here uh, after having tried to remove the um, physeal bar. And so he's got a valgus uh, knee. Uh, what I think is interesting on this case and would be really interested in some of the uh, input from some of our panel uh, is um, he's got a uh, essentially a varus knee on, the, uh, on his normal side, uh, valgus knee, uh, on his injured side, and to what extent do we uh, uh, go ahead and uh, correct him to? Do we correct him to what his normal side is, um, or uh, do we correct him to what is, you know, sort of the, the uh, norm uh, in society? Anybody have a thought on that? So, Maurizio, what, what, is, what is your thought um, uh, um, about this case here? So basically, uh, the valgus coming from the femur and the opposite leg has a varus coming from the tibia. You see the MPTA is 84 and the um, MLDFA is 89 on the opposite side. So um, in this particular side, I would try to bring the MLDFA to the normal value and I would not care much about trying to bring this to Varus, but I would try to bring this uh, lateral distal femur angle to the normal values to restore this to the neutral axis. Matt, uh, yep. Graves, do you have any other comments regarding this? Yeah, you know, I think this is one of the interesting things about planning and the timing of your planning with your discussions with the patient. Um, I like to talk to them about population norms and their contralateral norm and explain to them all the different areas where they're asymmetric. It's amazing to me when I 
try to focus on a single deformity, um, but do the entirety of the workup, how oftentimes I find a, another deformity that's creating, um, that maybe is not creating an issue for them, but which to them is, is very normal. And so I try to have that discussion with them and, and very much like Mauricio said, I, I prefer to correct to what their norm is, unless their norm is just way outside of the, the population norm. And then in that situation, I have a conversation with them and, and ask them, if we correct you to a population norm so that your knee joint theoretically should last longer, uh, it is gonna look different than the other side. And are you gonna be able to tolerate that? Or are you ready to have potentially a surgery on the contralateral side after this one has healed, even though it's not currently bothering you? Uh, and just make sure that they're aware that whatever correction that we choose together to do, uh, there are gonna be uh, consequences and compromises associated with the decisions typically, so. Okay. I, I would think that, just quickly, I think that the age of the patient is a big factor as well. So if in a 16 year old, you definitely wanna be as close to whatever norm you choose as possible, recognizing that the data that we use for our norms is relatively thin and certainly is in need of updating. But my decision about where to place the correction in a 55 year old is quite different than it would be in a 16 year old where there will already have been wear in the compartment that we're concerned about. Um, and so I think that does enter the calculus. Yeah, I'm curious. You know, we're, okay, we're talking could you about put it back to normal, like or or to his normal. Then, yeah, I would in a sixteen-year-old. I would go back. First of all, I mean, I the the precision of these measurements, I think, is plus or minus two to three degrees, and yeah. then intraoperative execution is at least that, unfortunately. And so, um, you know, maybe that is the role. If ever, if there is a role that ultimately to be able to navigate these corrections so that they are more precise. But for him, I would put him back to um, instead of looking at angles, I look at the intraoperative mechanical axis. And the question is well, the shape of the intercontinental laminates is, is quite different. So the French studies look at where the mechanical axis lies rather than, than the actual anatomic axis. And that is for the essentially the medial downslope of the medial portion of the eminence. So that's what I shoot for. I don't think there's any way to accurately measure the angles intraoperatively, but I would put him back as close as possible um, to what our population norm is, recognizing that population norms in Asia, particularly in the knee, are quite different than they are uh, in North America and Europe. A few of our participants have noted that they, they're concerned that, that the long leg view doesn't have the patellas right in the middle. Yep. Another source of error. Okay, Tim, why don't we move on a little bit? Yeah, okay. Uh, so here's another question uh, for the panel, I guess. Um, as, as a trauma surgeon, uh, uh, we use blade plates, uh, not as frequently now as we used to, but uh, we used to use blade plates a lot. And if we seat our blade plate parallel to the joint, uh, usually we correct the uh, deformity or correct the, uh, uh, get our alignment right relative to the fracture. Um, and so I put my uh, seating chisel in parallel to the joint here, at least I feel like it's parallel to the joint. Um, <clears throat> corrected my, uh, uh, you know, open, did an opening uh, wedge. I chose to do an opening wedge because for two reasons. One, um, he's 16 and, and felt that he would uh, fill this in easily. And two, that's where the deformity was. Um, but I, after uh, putting my blade plate in, uh, <clears throat> the correction wasn't as much as what I wanted. Um, and I was, Tom Higgins uh, had give, shown me a, a technique for when we do under correct uh, that allows us to be able to um, uh, 
correct that and it's using some some washers underneath the uh, the blade plate just to add some correction or add a little bit more varus because um, despite what I thought putting my blade plate in parallel uh, and being able to correct the small amount of apex anterior deformity on the lateral um, uh, I wasn't fully happy with my mechanical correction and, and to Keith's point uh, I tend to rely quite heavily on what I see in the operating room in, in this situation and so we sort of dialed in where I wanted that mechanical access based on uh, adding a couple washers underneath the plate and I'd just be interested in, in uh, some of the panel's thoughts on that. Um, may I make a comment? Yeah, sure. So it's somewhat predictable. This is a, a 95 degree blade plate, which um, would give you an ALDFA of 85 because the 95 is on the medial side. And if you had a, um, I mean, you can, you'd have to calculate that preoperatively because his MPK was 86. So I do the planning preoperatively, but this doing a parallel to the joint gives you an anatomic lateral distal femoral angle of 85 if you're flush against the shaft of the, of the femur, or it should is the way I understand it. So um, that's where the calculations could be a little bit off doing it this way. Yep. It's where it gets confusing though, right? Because a, a lateral distal femoral angle of 85 would be varus, not valgus. And Tim was saying he uh, thought he undercorrected by putting the blade parallel to the joint. So this is really interesting to me. I don't... Uh, As I, I was I'm, making my comment, Matt, I was thinking the yeah. same thing because, <laughs> because the anatomic 85, so the mechanical has got to be at least 90 yeah. with an MPTA of 86. So he should have a varus limb. Yep. And then I'm like, well, I'm already into my comments, so yep. I might as well just say it. <laughs> I saw that happen, actually, because the same thing happened to me when I was thinking through what I was going to say to this. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you spoke first. Um, I, I don't, I've had this problem before, correcting deformities with the angle blade plate. Um, and it, I think, and Keith, um, you've been around for a really long time, and I'm sure you can give us yeah. some details about... Uh, about this, but my understanding, at least from talking to, to Jeff Mast about this when I first saw it, was that the 95 degrees for the angled blade plate uh, was designed in order to allow you to create a, or to use an articulated tensioning device off the top of the plate to compress, thereby increasing the 95 degree angle a few more degrees to get you to what would be considered population average. Um, can you give us more information on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that was a considerable slop factor. And, and um, <laughs> the, the problem with it was is that the, the, the anticipating the amount of deformity in the plate that you could generate with a tensioner. And that's related to the blade length, um, as well as uh, being perfectly seated. And certainly it, it worked much better in the proximal femur and than it did in the distal femur. And so I, I think that, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a for, it's a kind of a happy and unhappy accident that this, this implant being used in, in both locations was as relatively accurate as it is, but you've all pointed out the inherent problems with um, uh, using as my, my impression is looking at that middle view is that the, and, I, and I, I can't measure it, but my my initial impression of the blade is that, it, is that you're slightly off in a frontal plane by that the width, the, the distance between the medial condyle and the blade is slightly larger than it's, which would build it into slight um, varus. So there's that. I mean, there are compounding potentials here. One is this, this very, very crude way we have of assessing mechanical axis, meaning here, hold this uh, bobby cord in the middle of the uh, center of rotation of the, of the head. Now hold the knee perfectly positioned. Now scan down and see the ankle as quickly as you can. 
I mean, you, you can count the number of places you can make errors there. So, and I've made them all. So number one is I think in general, most of us are, I don't, in, in, the, in the corrective mode, I don't think I've ever overcorrected an osteotomy. Um, I've undercorrected numerous times. And so I would generally, in this situation, have gone for slight um, valgus positioning of the blade distally. And then the stacked washer, a component is made up for by, if a lot of people are using lateral locking plates, the tomo effects variants. And if you have a locking construct, even though I don't like them as a general rule, the locking capability gives you the same um, potential without, uh, with just using a spacer, which is temporary until you lock this, the, the uh, side plate with uh, proximal screws. So, um, you know, is it, I, I'm not totally sure until I, I'm not even sure with your long leg film that you're really undercorrected. I mean, those look better, but you're, um, I don't think the rotation from side to side is the same even on this view. Um, what would be your thoughts about a possible lateral translation of the shaft in this case, and what would be the effect to the final correction? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, always, the, that's always the problem. And, you know, with opening wedges, we don't tension the plate um, in general. And if you do, um, if, you, if you've completed intention to plate, then certainly the potential for lateral shaft translation has to be factored into the correction. So with a lateral shaft translation, you would introduce certainly a mechanical axis. Now in this situation, you know, the translation is what, one or two millimeters max. So I, I don't think that's a factor here. Guys, there are a couple questions in the chat. One is that there, the valgus deformity exerts an increase to the adductor moment on the opposite knee. Would that be a concern in planning correction? And then the other question has to do with the uh, angle of the blade. And it notes that I've had this problem several times after planning. Can't we put the pin for a cannulated blade plate in at a pre-measured angle from parallel? Then we can be more precise with the blade plate or a distal femoral locking plate. Yeah, I think the cannulated chisels made it a lot easier. This was pre-cannulated chisel time. Uh, so um, I think that uh, it's much easier now to uh, plan out that angle and, and uh, um, be able to put your seating chisel then uh, down, you know, know exactly where your seating chisel is going to be based on placing your guide pin and being able to adjust that guide pin. I think once you put your seating chisel in though, it's pretty tough to make a small adjustment uh, in the overall uh, alignment, so. Yeah, the, the problem with opening wedges like this, if you're using a, a plate, a, a locked plate, is that you can't get the plate in the correct position to the shaft if you're gonna do an opening wedge in order to get the initial wire where you want it to be for your planning. So you can plan ahead, um, but you're going to run into some trouble unless you create the osteotomy, open it up, hold it in place, and then put the plate on. Now it's very, you know, closing wedges are significantly easier to tweak in that way, but I've, I've struggled a bit with trying to do the opening wedge that way. One of the things we've done in the past using angle blade plates for opening wedge was not to insert the blade parallel to the joint, but if we were planning to do a kind of correction, we would insert the blade plate with the angle that we were planning to correct. Uh, so by correcting um, the deformity, just uh, when you insert the angle blade plate with the angle that you wanna open, you may end up with the final correction that you want. Just if you, you, if you trust, the angle blade plate is going to work as a very precise device. What I'm trying to say is that sometimes the trick is uh, you go with K wires with the angle that you want to correct. And then as the angle blade plate is going to be inserted parallel to the K wire, once you get the plate adjusted to the shaft, you're going to correct the deformity. This is the way uh, Pacola has published about. And this is the way we've used angle blade plates in the past. Totally agree. 
A great question in the chat is, is the biplanar osteotomy also a consideration for a young age patient? I would say a biplanar osteotomy nowadays is something that has been very much advocated. There are many pros um, about using biplanar. One of those is broader surface of area. Other would be inherent instability and other is that you're not going to have any risk to expose your extensor mechanism to the blade plate, to the oscillating saw. So I see advantage to do biplanar in, in those cases. Tim, can I ask a question about your technique? So did you have the tensioning device and distraction at the top of the blade plate as you were trying to uh, open it up to get to the right level? Or how did you, how did you do that portion of the procedure? Yeah, um, we used a laminar spreader uh, on okay. this. Or I, I would assume we use a laminar spreader. There's no uh, ATD hole up there. Okay. Uh, and and I wasn't planning on tensioning this with the sure. ATD, so sure. um, I probably would have used a laminar spreader. But again, this is a while back, uh, yeah. so um, good, good well, question, well, Tom, I guess. Does anybody okay. have any other tricks as far as uh, trying to uh, improve the measuring intraoperatively? Um, I've gone from a bulby cord, now I use a, 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 a reaming guide wire, which uh, I think is a, a little bit stiffer, but does anybody have any other uh, tricks? There's also the insert that you can put um, on top of the OR table under the cushions that gives you the lines uh, marked out. That's hard to get, you gotta go to Germany to get it, but it's a nice option. Road trip? Yep. Yeah, there's even a, a stouter uh, rod that comes in the osteotomy set um, that that I've transitioned to using if I don't have the ball tip guide rod around and I have the osteotomy set open. It's the same concept though. I, you know, the the bovi really does uh, really does move. Uh, it's very flexible. Problem, the big problem with those intraoperative measurements are always related to the fact that it's a known weight bearing situation yep. first, and you can have also rotational component intraoperatively that you have to be very aware about it. I've been burned badly in morbidly obese patients using an intra-op mechanical axis measurement and then seeing them come back to clinic and weight bear and uh, really hating myself. Yeah. It's, uh, I think we should I would say, one thing I would say with regards to Bovi cord is that, you know, it just can't, uh, people tend to want to lay it right on the skin and uh, it needs to be up off the skin so that it doesn't, you know, it's actually a true uh, measurement, and not uh, bending around the patella or something of that nature when they're, when it's right down on the skin. So um, we can probably move, Mike, we can probably move to the end. Yeah. One, one quick question, guys, that, that just sure. appeared that's a great one is, when using a, a blade plate in people with an open physis, what should be the distal extent? And how about in the case of a closed, in other words, how, how does an open physis impact your use of a blade plate? Well, I personally probably wouldn't use a blade plate in, a, in an open physis unless I was planning on closing that physis. If the, if the blade plate needed to go distal to the physis, um, I, you know, I would have a long conversation with the family that there's going to need to be either closing the opposite one at the same time or uh, going to need to do a, a lengthening procedure later on depending on their age and so uh, I would try hard to to preserve the physis if the physis was functioning appropriately. So your final thoughts Tim? Yeah um, I just I think that our, our discussion was quite interesting relative to where do we correct them to. Uh, I chose to correct them to the uh, population normal uh, as opposed to the patient normal. Uh, I don't know if that, you know, uh, sounds like there was uh, not full agreement on that and that kind of makes sense because there's not a ton of a ton of literature, I guess, out there saying what we should do. Um, we've talked uh, quite a bit uh, during the course about maintaining that medial cortex and, and the increased uh, stability that we have there. Um, and I think that's uh, helpful. I, I tell you, you know, 
we try so hard to make things perfect and and sometimes you know we're off just a little bit and i think that uh tom higgins uh, uh sort of technique of bailing us out with uh, washers was genius and after i i heard him talk about it you know i tucked it away and this was something that uh, saved me on this case uh to to get us pretty close to pretty close to good um so Thanks, I think Tim. that I think washers that can be or you know uh can help us uh, to when we're you know for whatever reason slightly off thanks tim i think that was a great case everyone else thanks great great discussion I'm going to now turn the uh, controls over to Maurizio to go over his case. Um, Thank you. And we'll uh, try to get through this case and then we have a, some more after that. Sure. So this is a patient who is 61 year old who has left knee pain and he has a history of knee trauma more than 50 years ago. These are the x-rays that um, were available at his first evaluation in my clinic. Um, you can see the AP lateral um, in the axial view of the patella in the long leg standing x-rays that shows um, significant bulbous deformity. And as a matter of fact, uh, this patient came to me uh, because he was uh, told that he would need a knee replacement and he came uh, seeking for a knee replacement. And this is what you can see objectively here. Uh, and here I would like to point out for a problem in this evaluation. This has been pointed out very nicely by Mitch Bernstein before. When you get long leg length, uh, standing x-rays, you have to take into consideration leg length discrepancy. Otherwise you're gonna have a pelvic tilt in the same way you see it here. So it's not a perfect uh, long leg standing x-ray, but it gives you a sense about the deformity of this individual. Then um, you can see uh, we run um, uh, the software to calculate his angles. The proximal tibial angle is normal, but the lateral distal femur angle is 69, and he has um, a, a significant deformity and a leg length discrepancy of four centimeters. So basically, uh, this is a, this is these are the problems we're dealing with. And, um, and now again, in summary, you can see the deformity, you can see the vulgus, and um, um, the problem, what you do, what's the list of problems that we have right now? This patient has significant knee pain, significant disability to walk, a vulgus deformity in the range of 20 degrees, Please pay attention to the obliquity of the joint line, which is generated by this very, very reduced lateral distal femur angle, left lower extremity shortening, and the patient is expecting to have a knee replacement. The patient has no concerns uh, whatsoever about leg length discrepancy. He has a shoe lift and he's happy with the shoe lift. He only wants to get rid of this, his pain. Any comments from the panel so far? Mauricio, one of the uh, I'm yes. sorry, Mauricio, one of the uh, uh, participants uh, indicated that the patella is not looking forward, but I think with sig the significant uh, valgus that the patient has here, it's hard for the patella to be in the center of the knee. Yeah, uh, what, what, uh, let's go back to the X. Yes, one of the things that I'd like to point out is sometimes these patients have a patellofemoral malalignment just because of the valgus, as you pointed out. But you see there is one third of overlap of the proximal tip fib joint, which is very reasonable to give us a sense. And also the x-rays show that the femoral condyles are orthograde. So there is no obliquity of the femoral condyles except for the fact that there is obliquity of the joint line. These are things that one has to take into consideration. So as I said, this patient came for the, uh, for the replacement. Uh, but if you look at the arthroscopic pictures, because we ended up doing an arthroscopy, his joint is very well preserved. So he had no mini sky tears. He had no big issues with cartilage. In the lateral compartment, yes, he has some degree of cartilage wear. I would name it probably outer reach two to three eventually, but not too bad. No exposure of the subchondral bone. 
And again, um, the question is, he's 61. These are um, the pictures of his arthroscopy. This um, is the deformity that we're dealing with, and this patient is really not very much interested to deal with leg length discrepancy. I Rick believe- yeah, It's Michael. Um, I'm just wondering, so the arthroscopy in this case is to decide whether it's worth going ahead with a osteotomy or whether you should go to a, some type of other reconstruction. Is that correct? I always add arthroscopy for this particular patient uh, after talking with him, explaining that I didn't see a lot of um, arthritis in the x-rays. I told him I would like to pursue uh, an osteotomy correction, but I always do arthroscopy in my cases to verify and to make sure that I'm not pushing the envelope too much. And this is part of my protocol. I always scope the knees first. But this is to confirm that this knee was not completely compromised by arthritis to, at my, in my, under my eyes to justify a knee replacement. I don't know if the panel has a different perspective. What do you, what do you think about the, the, <clears throat> the long-term viability of a, to of a standard knee replacement in this mechanical environment? Well, um, I would say, I would say very poor. He has a, um, um, you see, to get a total knee replacement for somebody with this significant extra deformity, I don't see this as a good option for the patient myself. Um, uh, it's a significant deformity that he has extra articular. And even to get a knee replacement there, you, your cuts would have to sacrifice some of um, uh, um, the areas of the ligaments. And you should have to need some special constructs to have a knee replacement there. And I would even say, in addition to those concerns, the only way that you're going to get the mechanical axis right with a replacement is to compromise on the joint orientation angle at it, which will really, really kill its long-term viability. Yes, absolutely right. Okay, great. Mauricio, one of the participants wants to know, do you think there's a role for MRI instead of the arthroscopy? Absolutely. Um, um, this patient always, um, uh, this patient didn't have an MRI, uh, but I, I, to be honest, when I looked at his um, knee exam and at his x-rays, I didn't consider that he would be an ideal candidate for a knee replacement. And I didn't consider that he would um, um, have a need for MRI because I would scope his knee anyways. And I tried to balance the, the, the costs of his treatment. This is what I ended up doing. But MRI, yes, is a good tool to give us more information ahead of time. I agree. So basically, uh, I did a planning for him, considering that I would correct his deformity. And the first option with the software was to do a lateral biplanar distal femur open wedge, various producing osteotomy. And you see the amount of correction that you have to do uh, in this particular patient, 22 degrees, an opening of 21 millimeters, and leg length would be uh, improved by 25 millimeters if I do that. But I saw potential problems by doing a lateral open wedge. Uh, first, um, it would make very difficult to adapt a distal femur plate, as Matt pointed out, uh, significant tension over the iliotibial band, Iliotibial bend friction is a big deal in those patients, uh, and stretching of the common peroneal nerve is always a big concern. And I believe that Rafi presented very nicely uh, the concerns that he has when you try to correct or to lengthen the concavity uh, uh, or the convexity of the deformity. So you have to make sure that when you're correcting the deformity, you're not stretching uh, neurovascular structures, or you have to take this into consideration very much. And this is a deformity that has been there for more than 50 years, most likely related to an early closure of the growth plate. So this was one of the options for the planning. And then I said, I always like to play with the planning. And then I did the second option, which was the opposite, a medial biplanar distal femur closing wedge. Uh, which is exactly the same amount of correction, I would not um, be able to really um, improve much the leg length discrepancy by doing a medial closing wedge, but I would not make this leg shorter. As you can see, the software can give me information about it, and I can calculate exactly how many millimeters I have to close. 
Uh, I have a broader contact surface. I have a better matching of the medial cortex. I can come with the plates that most likely is not going to impinge soft tissues and cause discomfort. And I'm not going to apply tension to the lateral structures of the knee, which would be appreciated most likely by the patient. The drawback is that, again, I cannot address very well leg length discrepancy by doing that. Any comments so far about these two options? Mitch, what do you think? You I, would I, I, had a, I, had a, I had a comment, a question actually for you, Mauricio. The, what, what is the relevance of, of breaking the medial hinge in an opening wedge or a closing or, or the lateral hinge in the closing wedge if you're using locking plates like you use or if you're using one of the smaller plates? Because I know you've talked about that before and, and those complications. Is that relevant to you? Yeah, it's relevant to me. Um, especially when I deal with open wedges, because um, um, I believe it, they are inherently more unstable. And if I have a hinge that breaks, it always concerns me in terms of secondary loss of uh, deformity, alignment, secondary loss of alignment. And I always try to pay attention to the hinge. And if I believe there is a translation of the hinge, um, most likely I would try to address that if I can catch this intraoperatively. Uh, and this is a very relevant topic to me. What are your thoughts about it? Uh, I have the same concerns about losing the correction. Um, the stability I've been less concerned because I, I typically use the Synthes Tomofix locking plates. Mm -hmm. So I'm not that concerned with that. Um, I have not done any prophylactic uh, tension plating on the other side or wiring. Do you do that in, in these large in these large wedges? Yeah, um, I would say most likely I do intraoperatively when I do my corrections. I have some K wires protecting my hinge when I close or when I open. Um, uh, in the past, I was used to have some screws crossing the hinge uh, to protect the hinge. And then talking also with Philip Lobenhofer, and uh, currently we have talked a lot about how to protect the hinge, even with some staples, uh, when we are not 100% happy with the hinge, uh, and when we have an intraoperative um, identified hinge fracture. But um, it's, I, I would say there is room for um, some discussion in this area. And in this very large uh, uh, wedge, this is always a big topic of concern to me. And this was a big concern to me in this case because of the amount of the correction. Have I answered your question, Mitch? Yes, thank you. One, one of the things that you can sometimes do even with, even though the Tomofix plates were not designed to do it, um, but if you lose your opposite side hinge, either medial or lateral, you can recreate some stability by tensioning the plate. Now, obviously there's no slot in the distal or in the more remote screw hole, but you can still, I still tension these plates all the time. And I think that that's the option. If you have wide, if you have lost the hinge and displaced it, then you have a secondary factor and that may warrant a secondary approach for either a staple if you use that or uh, I, I never used tension bands, but certainly used uh, sort of cortical substitutions on the opposite side. All right. So then uh, I had a discussion with the patient, um, and I believe it's a very important piece of the treatment to explain to the patients the expectations, what you can offer in terms of leg length um, discrepancy, in terms of alignment, in terms of uh, postoperative outcomes and risks, et cetera. And I talked to the patient and he said, I really don't care about my leg length a discrepancy. I care about improving my pain because this pain is very disabling to me on a daily basis. And my pain is mostly on the lateral side of the knee. So because of that, uh, the patient made an option uh, and, a, and it was a kind of shared discussion. And we, we moved towards a lateral, a medial closing wedge. And, um, and you can see here, this is my preoperative planning chart. And this is my intraoperative uh, C-arm picture showing 
how I place the K wires, where I plan to remove the wedge. I'd like to raise the attention to where I'm aiming with my K wires. I have four wires um, inserted from medial to lateral, two proximal to distal, and uh, you see they're aiming to an area in the condyle where I have, in theory, uh, the convergence of the lateral cortex and the shadow of my lateral condyle. I like to aim very distal to make sure that this is a very flexible area. I'm not aiming to this area, which is a cortical area. I try to aim to the metaphyseal area where the chances for hinge problems should be uh, less. Um, and then uh, this is what happened. And you can see I had a hinge fracture here. I did. Uh, and this is the final uh, intra uh, final x-ray right after. This is the biplanar cut. This is the posterior cortex. The plate is not spot on on the lateral view. As you can see, I'm catching the shaft, but it's not perfect. Uh, the critical thing is always to verify if those screws are not aiming the intercondylar notch. I always do the notch view during the case. And I try to make sure that the screws are not below the Blumensat line here, where you can see uh, the lateral view. Uh, this is now how it compares before and after. I would say I slightly overcorrected him to the medial aspect of the medial spine. Um, even, Mauricio, yes. There's two questions. If I can interrupt you, sorry. Please, please. Uh, one, one is, uh, did did you release or when would you release the perineal nerve and any femur opening wedge osteotomy? And then uh, this was closing wedge. So he's asking if you were doing an opening wedge. And then what was the purpose of the K wire that is below your yeah. two parallel ones? Let me go there first. Let me go to the other K wire. Um, this is an interesting one Let's um, to explain that. This is another trick. This wire tells me where the plate is going to sit. Before I do my osteotomy, I like to have my plate in place. Then I have a wire going through one of the holes of the plate. So I know exactly where the end of my plate is going to be. And then I know exactly where I would like to have my osteotomy. So this is a way to control where my plate is going to and where my osteotomy has to be placed. This is the purpose of this wire. Mercy, yeah. just a, sorry to interrupt. Did you have to bend this plate? Yes, I had to. Uh, is that okay to do that? No, uh, it's not okay to do that. But in this case, because I corrected the deformity with the closing wedge, I would say, and as this is not an angle blade plate, um, and it's a locking plate. Uh, I don't see how this is going to bring any extra factor to the correction of the deformity as I'm not using any standard screws to um, pull uh, the shaft or to push the shaft or to do something like that. Do you agree or do you have any other perspective about that? I, I agree. I just, uh, yeah, I agree because you're using all locking. Yeah, it's all locking as you can see. Uh, the critical thing is that it's to me very difficult um, to do this big correction without compromising the hinge somehow. And I see um, the other thing I didn't like much, I have some small translation of the shaft here. Um, um, my biplanar cut is fine. I don't have any kind of um, recurvation or procurvation in this case. Uh, but um, in my final alignment for the uh, frontal plane, I would say it, it shows a significant improvement. Although it's not uh, exactly neutral, it's slightly varus at this point. So, uh, these are. Right. Mauricio, when you lose the hinge intraoperatively in mm -hmm. this situation, then the, the, your control over the correction is obviously compromised. What do you do in that situation? So, so that you can... yeah, it's a great point. So in this particular case, um, uh, I, I try to use the alignment rods and to have a kind of intraoperative double check. Uh, although I don't trust it 100% because of the reasons I pointed out before, it's a non-weight bearing situation, um, it's not, exactly what you're going to see when the patient is bearing weight. 
intraoperatively, I had an alignment that was a little better than the one you can see here. My rod was exactly at, in between the two spines and here I'm medial to the medial spine. So I ended up overcorrecting, and I believe this happened because I didn't control the hinge in the way um, it should be done. Uh, and this is the, uh, being critical to what has happened. Mauricio, uh, we've got a couple more questions. Sure. One is, would a 90 degree condylar plate be acceptable? And the second one has to do with uh, uh, closing the wedge. So the question is, do you have any instrument or technique that helps you close the wedge slowly? We talked about the multiple uh, osteotomes to very slowly open. Yeah. What, what techniques do you use to very slowly close? So what I try to do to, uh, is to make sure that the wedge is completely removed, that my hinge is not very, uh, um, uh, how can I say that? That I try to use a drill bit that goes across my hinge in a way that I can make it a little weak. So when I start closing, I don't have a lot of resistance on the opposite cortex. So I try to use a hinge just to weaken my opposite cortex a little bit. And I go progressively trying to close manually. And I never go with the long stress. I go progressively with the stress to make sure that um, um, it's not going to apply a lot of tension to the opposite cortex. But sometimes you hear a crack. Um, I don't have any specific other method um, to do that. I go progressively and, and slowly. I don't know if somebody, any of you has a different method to close Matt the mentioned, Yeah. Matt, you want to talk about what you mentioned? Sure. Um, you know, it, it, I think Mitch probably gave the best answer. It, it depends on your experience and what you have technically to use and how large the correction. But the majority of the time, I'm not correcting past what an articulated tensioning device will allow. So after I seat the plate distally with the osteotomy still being incomplete, I connect the tensioning device proximally and then I slowly turn to uh, compress and it allows me to watch the correction uh, and to control the correction throughout. Uh, and I've found it to be a really reproducible technique. Uh, you know, it's something Jeff Mass showed me a long time ago and it, I think it's a, it's a nice controlled way to do it, so. Very good. I might also add, um, I think that when I'm doing a closing wedge, I tend to take my osteotomy closer to the cortex than maybe I do with an opening wedge leaving a little bit more uh, material on the opposite side to keep it from cracking. But, but when you're closing, if, you, if your osteotomy doesn't go really pretty close to the cortex, I've found that you know, it hinges over that portion that's not cut yet and, and can increase uh, cracking on the opposite side. Anybody else? change their osteotomy just a little bit, whether they're doing a closing or opening like that relative to that point? What I like to do, to be honest, uh, when, every time when I do a wedge, I like to secure my hinge intraoperatively with K wires that are crossing the, wing, the hinge. Uh, then when I start close, closing or opening, I, I try to make sure that I have something holding somehow uh, my uh, wedge. The problem sometimes happens when you start applying the screws to the plate and um, that eventually, especially if you use uh, standard screws that are going to um, uh, push the plate against the bone, uh, this is going to cause a problem uh, and you may have a crack. So this is the patient after one year. As you can see, um, it's completely healed. This is uh, what happens with closing wedges. Um, they heal very fast. Mauricio, yeah. Yeah. Joe, Joe Shasker has a question for you and the rest of the faculty. Yeah. Have you considered doing the simultaneously opening lateral and closing medial? You have a hypoplasia on the lateral side. Yeah, so this is a, a great question as well. Thank you, Joe. Um, yes, uh, this was a discussion if I would have to correct uh, completely medial or completely lateral, trying to balance a little bit, opening a little bit medial and a little bit in closing a little, a little bit lateral and medial. Uh, to be honest, um, I've never done this way and um, I didn't feel that um, I would be 
very precise during that way. Uh, and this is the reason why I didn't, but this is a very relevant comment. Thank you. So basically, just to conclude this case or to close, um, I had a slight um, 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 uh, overcorrection to Varus. For somebody with lateral pain, uh, ended up being a relief of the pain. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, um, and he is feeling very happy about this part. So he's no longer having knee pain uh, um, because he has a more balanced gait now. Uh, and you see the discrepancies is still there, uh, in the, but it's not as much as it was before. I ended up gaining a little bit of length. Uh, and um, in terms of uh, final thoughts, I would say um, this would be a case that I don't have a great answer. I was not 100% happy with the case. Reasons for that, um, I was not happy with the hinge. Number one, uh, I was not planning to overcorrect by five degrees. I was planning to be neutral. Uh, I ended up overcorrecting a little bit, which didn't cause any impact to the patient, uh, gait, et cetera, uh, because this patient is happy, but I was personally not 100% happy. Also, I was not happy that I didn't address leg length discrepancy, which would be part, and I proposed to the patient ahead of time we are gonna get your leg straight first, and then we are gonna lengthen your leg with a rod. And after he came to me and I'm following this patient, he says, doctor, I don't wanna do any correction to my leg length. I'm happy with my shoe lift. I don't have pain. I don't have any concerns and nothing else to do. So I, um, the patient may be happy. I'm not 100% happy because I couldn't do everything I was planning to. Uh, but for this patient, um, I would say we ended up meeting his goals. So as a message to me, osteotomies may be considering individuals older than 60. There is a kind of um, a dogma that says if somebody is over 60 and has a deformity, this patient needs a, a, a replacement. Um, I don't agree with this statement at all. I have very young, active 60-year-old males in females that come to my clinic mm -hmm. that are super active and I don't favor replacements for those patients if they have good joint space, if the, there is no significant interarticular pathology mm -hmm. and they have significant deformity. I favor to correct deformities and to preserve the joint. Um, and the correction of a valgus deformity should take into consideration the risks of iatrogenic nerve palsy. There was a question about when to release the peroneal nerve um, uh, in this case, I didn't because uh, I didn't promote a significant lengthening of the leg and I didn't apply a lot of tension to the lateral side because I ended up closing the medial side. And this was the strategy not to have to think about it. Also, the patient had pain on the lateral side and when you stretch out the lateral structures like the IT bands, um, it's not very comfortable for the patients in the beginning. Uh, and this is the reason why I did a planning going to the medial closing by planner. And you saw it heals very well without deformity in the sagittal plane and without any other issues. And leg length discrepancy should be part of the discussion with those patients. You have to make sure that you have a plan ahead of time and you understand their needs. So these are my final comments about this case. And if you have any other comments, I'm very open to feedback. Maurizio, that was a great case. I thought there were some great questions there. I do want to point out one thing that uh, all of you did a great job uh, in the previous things because everyone's critically looking at all of your x-rays, making sure patellas are pointed forward. So I think Maurizio and, uh, and Mitch and uh, Raul, who all went over how to plan these things, uh, kudos to you guys because I think uh, people are learning how important that is. At this point, I think I'll turn over the, um, the uh, stage to Keith, uh, Keith Mayo to go over his case. Keith? Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, these are the uh, films that an 18 year old uh, male who's a little over a year out from a, a motorcycle multiple trauma he had bilateral distal femurs and some other issues going on. The original injury was uh, grade two open reputedly and um, did not have any secondary wound problems. Um, but because of his bilateral injuries, he spent 
a little over three months in a wheelchair. I'm not sure exactly why that was. So at the time we're seeing him, he's got uh, global knee pain on the lateral side. It looks like some of that is uh, related to his condylar buttress plate. And there is his uh, knee range of motion. So he's uh, got a total arc of 70 degrees with a significant extension deficit. And the soft tissues um, are actually in pretty good condition at this point. Um, and we're trying to assess uh, this. You can, you, those of you who are astute can see the problems here. This is a non weight bearing alignment film. Um, and that's the problem. So I'd be interested to see if anybody can solve the issues of limb axis and the patient with a significant knee flexion contracture. So we, I've never really been able to understand. Um, so I'll invite input as to what you do in the situation of knee flexion contracture as far as evaluation of alignment as well as limb length. Anybody got any solutions to that problem? What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, uh, if you look at those x-rays, um, it seems that uh, we do have um, um, an issue with the alignment of the condyles there. Um, uh, I would say um, you can definitely say that uh, there should be something that could be intraarticular in this particular case, looking at those pictures. And this patient has significant uh, compromise of the range of motion. And this is a very young uh, person that um, certainly needs to be addressed with any kind of joint preservation procedure to improve his function. Mitch, do you have any comments about it? You, were t you talked a lot about it in, your, in, uh, in the first couple of weeks. Can you just repeat the comment? I was answering a question. Is it regarding LLD correction? Evaluating um, deformities with flexion contractures. Is that correct? Oh, yes. That was a hot topic at the beginning. <laughs> so uh, it, It's difficult. You cannot do it with AP imaging accurately. Uh, you, you, need, you need lateral uh, images of the bones in question. And of course, they have to be calibrated, but it, it's definitely a lot more difficult than uh, patients who don't have coronal, uh, sorry, don't have contractures. Okay, Keith, why don't you uh, move forward then? Okay, so I, I have to say at this point, I really don't know what's going on. And my major concerns are his knee motion. And I think that's always a problem in these situations with sort of delayed reconstructions, which involve um, either periarticular or intraarticular deformities. And so my impression was that there was probably an intraarticular malunion, but that he was probably, although I couldn't be for completely certain that there was also a residual distal femoral varus deformity. Keith, um, why were you thinking there was probably an intraarticular malunion based on the presentation? Uh, I wasn't on the basis of the presentation. It's just that he, if you look at his um, the lateral, uh, despite the fact that it wasn't very good, um, I have two different condylar profiles. But I didn't have enough information to really, I mean, it wasn't clear to me why he had this, this much extension deficit. And this is an absolute passive extension deficit. So not, not an extensor lag. This is a true block. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I, I, I was, um, I didn't think I had enough information. And, and part of that was because of the implants and part of it was because of the imaging. So um, we went ahead and moved, removed his implants and um, so that I had a better way to assess his deformity and then also at the same time get additional imaging. So these are his images after, um, after the implant removal. I guess the question is here is, you know, in, in situations in which there is 
periarticular, intraarticular uh, deformity, and a soft tissue component, you know, where do you place the soft tissue uh, mobilization component? I mean, it's, it certainly comes up in the elbow all the time. So how big a soft tissue release? Should I have done a quadriceps plasty, for instance, when I did the plate removal laterally? Mauricio or Jim, you got either one of you want to comment on that? I, I think I, I start working uh short of that but then if i'm not getting what i need uh i i would if i had to um i think you've got to get that motion back uh in order to succeed but mauricio what do you think i agree uh i agree with your comment um during this time when you do a hardware removal i use hardware removal for planning uh for two reasons number one to rule out infection to make sure that i take some samples and i'm i'm sure that nothing is there like a low grade infection or something like that. I also use the opportunity to do a complete release of the joint, trying to get some motion and trying to get this patient to passive motion rehab to see how better he can be just by, by removing hardware and, and releasing soft tissues around, even if it's not going to generate perfect here, because as you, as um, it looks like now much better to see there is a flexion deformity of one of the condyles. There is a mismatch of the condyles, the lateral projection of the X-ray. One, one other little tip I've learned the hard way in my practice is that with really bad uh, contractures like this, and I, I, from knee dislocation, seen a number of them, I admit these people for a couple of days for pain control because I've found if I try to send them home uh, that, that they have enough pain, they just don't move the knee. And so I admit them and put them on a CPM at full motion, hopefully right out of the gate. And, and I've had much more success with that than even in cases where I only did an arthroscopic release, I still admit them and, and, and use blocks to try and control their pain. Hey, okay. Keith, um, what do you think about the other issue I had here is I was concerned that, um, that his flexion component was related to his patellofemoral articulation. What do you think about the position of the patella here? Any comments? Like, I mean, this is I think this is about a thirty degree lateral view. So, is the, I mean, the insole Savati index is probably okay. I'm, I'm, is that going to be part of my plan? I mean, what am I going to do with that? Yeah. So this is really interesting. I mean, I, this is the best lateral view I've ever seen to see uh, asymmetry of the condyles. So that's that's a fantastic view. I, I don't. I would have assumed that uh, the lack of full extension was related to the asymmetry of the condyles and the flexion deformity that you're seeing. But I, I uh, the patellofemoral joint looks terrible, um, and I I assume it would be very very hard to understand until the lateral femoral or excuse me until the condylar correction was complete. Uh, and I was wondering if this I'm sure this case was from. A ways back, I was wondering if this was something that you would consider 3D printing or a model in order to better understand at this point in time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, this is sort of the early days of modeling. Um, sure. And um, and I, it was probably at the time when we, were, when we had um, 3D reconstructions as well, um, but we went ahead and got a 3D model. It was a... Uh, 3D printer model earlier, we had to send it off. But anything else we want to say, we can see that there's, um, I mean, there are a, a variety of procedures been described for patellofemoral deformity. Um, I guess the question is always, how aggressive do you want to be? Um, and as far as what, what you're willing to, to sacrifice in terms of viability um, of, of the intraarticular components. So I'm just going to cut to the chase. So we went to a... Are you more concerned about deepening the groove in order to allow the patella to track more appropriately? Or are you concerned about um, the asymmetry of the groove? I'm, I'm confused about which yeah. way you're going with that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm concerned about, I think, I can't remember what I calculated as, as ratio, what, but I, I was concerned that he had a, a mild patella infra I was yep. worried about my intraoperative surgical access um, and because I did not do an extensive quadplasty. I mobilized uh, 
from the super patellar pouch proximally, but I did not go into the joint because I thought I was going to be there anyhow. Um, uh, and so there were a, a lot of issues that um, since I did, um, you know, there are osteotomies described for the trochlea, but I thought that multiplanar osteotomies in the situation were beyond my skill set. But I was worried about access and whether or not I could do anything as far as patellar tracking intraoperatively after we corrected the intraoperative plan. Okay, so. So this is the plan um, and this was based on, you'll see the model in a minute, but basically this classic sort of medial subvastus approach. And, and I would, had planned for whatever you want to call a Fulkerson type uh, tubercle osteotomy. Um, and I was, I was worried about, I had initially planned on doing a secondary osteotomy through the medial femoral condyle to extend the trochlear component but it was quickly evident to me intraoperatively that was going to be uh, far more complex than I really wanted to deal with. Was your tubercle osteotomy thought in order to bring it more proximal because of the Baja or? Yeah. That, okay. Yeah. Well, it was both access because I didn't, yeah. I mean, he was just, comp when I got the joint open, it's completely socked in. I mean, it's yeah. a huge cyclops and it took me a long time just to identify normal structures. And um, and then the, the superpatellar pouch, as, as you might expect, was completely uh, fibrotic as well. And the thing that I wasn't prepared for was how incredibly osteoporotic his bone was when it came time to do the cuts. Um, and I think that I probably could have done this without a model if I had really good 3D uh, recons and appropriate intraocular planning, but we we did have an early model to go by. And the thing that bothered me the most about this was this sort of trough left in the medial part of the trochlea. I elected not to even expose that. Um, I had planned to elevate it and put bone graft underneath it um, and hope for the best. But the tracking, at least intraoperatively, um, was bare, this area was barely engaged um, by the time we got into, um, you know, and I, I guess the other question was, I wasn't clear to me that I would get improved knee extension just by normalizing, because my, my, my idea of the kinematics of this knee was uh, pretty crude, and so I wasn't sure, but it actually did surprisingly improve knee extension passively. Um, and then this is what he looked like afterwards. A lot more fixation than I anticipated uh, just because of the porosity. Um, I did not ultimately do a tubercle osteotomy. And I, I still think his patella is low. And I had prepared him for a secondary uh, distal femoral uh, mild valgus producing osteotomy on the basis of my intraoperative alignment films. And I anticipated that time that we would also do either a patellar tendon lengthening or a tubercle osteotomy. Um, but this is what he was. I think the next his final follow-up, this is at seven years and I, he's basically disappeared. And so, I don't know where my limb axis went. Now, let's see. There we go. So he's still in slight varus, but he's uh, completely disappeared. And that's his end motion. So he still has a, both a passive and active knee extension deficit, which is far from optimum. But he's working quite. Uh, <clears throat> He actually is a, a diesel mechanic on locomotives, so he's climbing all over uh, these engines all day and did not want any further surgery at this point. Hey, Keith, uh, it's a great case. Uh, my question for you is, if you think that the virus that he has comes from the femur or comes from the tibia, because looking at your x-rays to the a long leg standing x-rays, it seems to me that he has bilateral virus but I'm not sure if it's coming from the femur exactly. 
I don't know uh, if, it, if it would come a little bit from the tibia, looking at just grossly to the x-rays. Well, we'd, we, we'd actually discussed uh, preoperatively that I thought it would be much easier for me to correct his varus that was residual in the proximal tibia because that was the original, even if it were, even if it were giving him a slightly non-anatomic tibial an anatomic axis. Um, <clears throat> and so if we'd gone back, and theoretically, um, that would have been the, the strategy. It would have been a proximal tibial, um, mildly valgus producing um, osteotomy with the unknown of what to do with the extensor mechanism. And I don't, I, I mean, I'm, of all, all of the issues which I've dealt with infrequently, the, the problems with patella infra are, have been, I think, the most unsatisfying things I've ever dealt with. So that's why I brought it up. Sure. Keith, any, um, any technical tips about how to mobilize fibrotic scar tissue from the cartilage? Because I've had cartilage peeling off with the debridement of the fibrotic tissue in the joint when they have contractures like this. What do you do differently? I, I, just because of that same issue, basically I don't try. I basically go through the level of fibrosis. And I'd better just, um, if, it, if it, I'll start with a free or distally, and if I can elevate a flap easily, then I'll do it. Otherwise, I think they're better off with me um, leaving a layer of fibrosis, opposing fibrosis, than delaminating uh, the underlying layer. So um, I've had the same experience. So I just basically, in the, in the patch area, I just went basically in the, in the mid sagittal plane right through the cicatrix and I reduced it a little bit, but that was it. I don't know your experience, but in my practice, most of the issues I've had are with the scar tissue uh, behind the patellar tendon. Uh, and this is where we have a lot of issues with um, a very thick extensor mechanism or very hardened, very hard uh, patellar tendon, which is hardened by the scar tissue around that area. So uh, what I try to do, I try to release the soft tissues around the extensor mechanism and I try not to go uh, where the cartilage is exactly because of the way you described, Matt, you're going to end up peeling off uh, some of this cartilage. And, and there's a question, so I'm not sure it was fully understood because I think I know the answer uh, here, uh, Keith, but someone asked, did you have to release soft tissues for that flexion contracture or was the osteotomy enough? And I think I understood extensive soft tissue release as well, but Wanted to make sure you you uh, clarify that for him. Yeah, I had I had gone through the pouch on the lateral side, and we went back through it, the same area. It was staged by about a month, so it was already socked in again. Um, and I'd done a a, a very non aggressive quadplasty uh, on the lateral side. Um, the major improvement in motion, I still think, was related to creating a more congruent joint. Certainly I didn't do anything to improve his knee extension except for the mechanical relationships between the condyles. I did not do a posterior soft tissue release, um, although that had been considered at the time. And Keith, just to clarify for those that are listening to us, uh, when you have to go posterior for soft tissues release and the patient is supine, what's your strategy to release those soft tissues? the posterior aspect of the knee. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I have to say my experience for those is primarily related to CP patients um, with flexion contractures where I'm dealing with normal anatomy and, and the, the division between uh, the posterior capsule and uh, the gastroc and um, on, the, on the medial side is much more straightforward. I have to say that the idea of going posterior to this uh, and this joint actually terrified me, which was a reason why I didn't want to do it. But it would have been um, trying to reestablish a capsule or plane posteriorly before I actually did any of the intraarticular work. And then um, making sure that I was working in flexion and basically just do, basically doing a posterior capsular release only and hoping that, was good, that would be the issue. In the late cases, there's always a question of whether um, you got to deal with the posterior cruciates and other issues, but you guys are much more well versed in that than I am. So I'd be interested in your opinion. 
So what I normally do uh, when I have to do those things with the patient supine, I try to go behind the MCL. So I go posterior to the medial femoral cone dial and I try to go flush to the bone and I try to develop this plane that you described to release the capsule from the bone. And then you go posterior to the cone dial, posterior to the shaft or to the metaph metaphyseal area, going flush to the bone just to release this capsule, which sometimes is adhered to the bone there. If you go from medial to lateral, um, it's sometimes easier and safer. And Lobenhofer has published an article about that. And this has helped me many times when I had flexion contractures and significant uh, scar tissue in the back of the knee. Keith, there's a question about, did, did, were you concerned about arthrosis in the knee and was arthroplasty a possible plan B or did you have any other bailout uh, potential if you hit uh, really significant arthrosis? Not really, actually, at 18, I didn't even consider arthroplasty. Um, so I, I and um, he was happy enough with the initial correction that he was functional. Um, I, I think that, I mean, people have become much more aggressive with the lower limit for arthroplasty. I think that's probably, in my experience, far more appropriate in the hip than it is in the knee. Um, um, but I, in this situation, arthroplasty was really never on the table. So just in summary, I think that in these complicated cases with previous surgery, I don't make any decisions before the implants are out. Mauricio's already pointed out the issue with even um, uh, in pristine situations, uh, making sure you don't have an occult infection. And then the, I think the idea is to get a congruent joint, so more sophisticated multiplanar osteotomies or dealing with osteotomies of two of the three uh, joints in the knee, I think is really uh, potentially at least asking for trouble. And then I think the, the hardest thing to know what to do with is what, how you manage the soft tissues preoperatively. I think it's quite clear that in delayed settings, um, we can be more aggressive with soft tissue releases than certainly we would ever think about in an acute trauma setting. So if you're, you're, I, your chances of success are enhanced rather than diminished by more aggressive soft tissue uh, releases at the time. And then Jim's already pointed out the advantage of when we've done these cases, um, you know, we've always used an indwelling epidural catheter and kept them in the hospital for at least 72 hours um, with aggressive range of motion protocols that are then uh, followed up afterwards. Okay. Thanks, Keith. I think that was a great case. Good questions. Um, we're going to, we have about, uh, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, I think we'll move on to our next case. Um, I think we're going to do this case uh, of a proximal tibial deformity. We have some other cases that we won't get to, um, but I still think this one's a pretty good one that uh, um, that Mike Miranda is going to go over. Um, I'm going to give him control right now. Go ahead. Okay. So this is a 68-year-old, excuse me, 68-year-old woman who has a tibial plateau fracture, and her index procedure uh, is here. You could see that she has an open reduction internal fixation, primarily performed through a lateral, uh, uh, through a lateral uh, serp serp uh, serpentine approach, and uh, she has this plate fixation, and. She presented to my office about 14 months after her, uh, after her injury and after her fixation, and her chief complaint was pain with ambulation and instability with ambulation. Um, you can see her erect notch view here. You can see that she has somewhat of a pagoda deformity where it's sort of uh, uh, conical in shape. Um, and she has uh, uh, obvious lucencies uh, in the metaphysis and uh, so the next step was to get a CT scan. The CT scan obtained uh, documents 
uh, not only uh, malunion, but also some areas of nonunion. And you can see that she's got her uh, fixation is still in situ. I do appreciate uh, Keith's uh, comments about removing the hardware. It definitely gives you better imaging and it gives you some um, uh, <clears throat> opportunity to sort of to initiate range of motion uh, issues, uh, range of motion for these folks, uh, which is really helpful. So the question is, what's her diagnosis and uh, what's her problem list? So because of time, I'm going to sort of try and uh, move this along here. So she has, you can see that she has a, a persistent lateral depression. You can see that she also has uh, a non-union across the metaphysis medially. And she also has malunion laterally. So the question is, what do you do in this patient? She's 68 years old. It's now 14 months after her ORIF with non-union and malunion aspects to this proximal tibia. Any thoughts uh, from folks uh, what to do, what they would consider doing? I think so. Several options, but uh, invite, invite the uh, uh, faculty to chime in. I, I, have a, I have a comment. I'll jump in ahead of Matt there. Yeah. I, I think I, I've had a case, I have two cases like this. And for me, an intraarticular osteotomy like this is very challenging. Just relating to some of the questions in the chat, I think in terms of options, if you're, if, if you're comfortable doing the deformity planning and execution of, of this type of osteotomy, I think it's probably the better way to go. I would imagine that, uh, you know, we all have different levels of uh, skills and, uh, and abilities. So, that's where the discussion would go for me is what to choose would be really, how can I assess this properly and do I have any experience doing this? Matt? Yeah, you know, I think the hardest part about this is the age of the patient, you know? I mean, in a younger patient, it would be sort of a no-brainer procedure in terms of an intra and extra articular osteotomy, but in a 68-year-old, you know, your skill level is gonna be challenged a lot more aggressively by osteoporosis and, um, so I think uh, it's a it's a tough call. Uh, I would have both conversations with the patient for sure. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know. Anybody who does mega prostheses or uh, these tumor prostheses, any experience in uh, dealing with these patients? Any particular challenges that you might identify in that option? So. I, I've done those procedures and um, they are very challenging in many regards. One of those is related to the extensor mechanism of the knee that you have to reattach. And sometimes when you don't have bone, you have to reattach the extensor mechanism to uh, the prosthesis. The way I overcome that is by rotating the medial gastrocnemius on top of the um, prosthesis. And so I can reattach the patellar tendon to soft tissues and not to the prosthesis. Um, those prostheses are not long-lasting prostheses. Uh, they don't last very long. Uh, they're not very stable in terms of um, axial control. They don't have the same kind of outcomes as the primary replacements do. What do you estimate as far as duration? You said they don't last very long. So in a 68-year-old? Yeah, and I believe that what has been mentioned before by Matt and, uh, and Mitch is very relevant. You have to ask yourself if you have the skills, you have to look at the patient's profile and see what kind of patient are you dealing with. Is normal BMI, normal bone density, what's the level of activity? All those things matter when you make a decision like that. And as I said, if she's a very active person, 68 is somebody that for sure, if she's healthy, she's going to be around for more than 20 years or 15 years. And I, I don't believe this kind of prosthesis is, is going to last that long. Okay. So the, the one other thing that I might bring up is I've seen several patients come in with uh, an infected version of this, and that's pretty catastrophic. And I would say that uh, in addition to the, the poor longevity, if that occurs, that's really serious, especially in a 68 year old. So always got to keep that in mind as a, a something else on the matrix. Great, excellent comment. Consideration, consideration might be um, uh, 
just to take the hardware out and then uh, fall back and have have a discussion. You might have a chance to be able to uh, take a look at what the cartilage looks like uh, and whether you know what the quality of bone is and have a better understanding as to whether you think you can uh, reconstruct it and then repeat your CT scan afterwards. It essentially allows you to just sort of you know have some time to think about it. Uh, with a little bit more information. Absolutely. Did I miss her range of motion, Mike? Yeah, so it was uh, her range of motion. She lacked about uh, 15 degrees of extension and she had flexion uh, uh, to about, just about 85 degrees. So just under 90 degrees. Okay. All right. So my choice was to uh, perform an osteotomy with the revision op uh, ORIF. And my thought process was uh, that number one, her biggest issue was she had been already living with this thing for 14 months and it was all about function. So I, I hope to at least get her union and get her a stable limb that she can ambulate on, recreate some bone stock so that if she needed an arthroplasty, that could be performed and also to create a, a stable limb for her. And uh, so that was at least my thought. Yeah. Let's go back. Um, let's see, having, there we go. There's a question while you're going through that, would a revision prosthesis with metaphyseal sleeves rather than a mega prosthesis be an option? Definitely um, better than a mega prosthesis. Okay. Do you want to expand on that? Well, the, the difference is that when you use the metaphyseal sleeves and things like that, you preserve a far greater portion of the bone stock on both sides of the joint. So that, that's more akin to doing a revision of a primary to, you know, a secondary knee, as opposed to taking out a pretty massive segment of each of the bones where if it goes bad, it's, it's pretty much done deal. And the constraint on the joint is, is improved. So I think that is a better middle ground if you were, were to go that way. Right. So in these cases, it's always helpful, as we've emphasized from the beginning, to generate a problem list. And one of the reasons why it's helpful, when you start listing the various problems and you list, it, you list your tactic for resolving those problems, sometimes you'll get into competing agendas. And it's, it's really important to resolve those before you get to the operating room. In this situation, you know, you have malunion, you want to create correction. And you also have nonunion, often, very often nonunion, um, you know, you have to get com compression in order to gain union, but you also want to create your cor uh, correction. So the, the question is, is how do you resolve that? In this situation, using allograft uh, wedges uh, in this uh, older woman uh, was the way to do, was my, at least my plan. And I also planned uh, 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 to possibly do a fibular neck osteotomy. And the reason why is if you have a bo two bone uh, uh, limb, uh, or an area of the limb. Uh, if you have deformities at the metaphysis, you often have to treat the two bones as one. In other words, you have to, in order to get correction, you have to osteotomize both of them in order to uh, resolve uh, and create your uh, uh, correction. So I have a uh, large distractor on laterally, trying to take some of the pressure off, osteotomes, trying to identify the areas uh, of non-union and malunion. So, One's transverse, one's vertical as far as the osteotomies. Doing open wedge and opening the metaphysis and uh, using a, a wedge allograft to help me uh, resolve that. And preliminary fixation. And I think at this point, um, I've got my graft in place and I'm starting to create compression. But I would point out here that I think the lateral side is undercorrected. And my original plan for fibular neck osteotomy, uh, I think at this point should have been, uh, should have been strongly considered and, and I should have done it uh, because I think we're undercorrected here. So I use a rim plate to uh, create joint fixation and then buttress. I use rim plates, uh, uh, to me, uh, uh, it's really helpful cr for creating compression across the joint, uh, which is uh, super important. And this is her at uh, 
postoperatively. Union achieved, she has residual instability. She really had very little pain, but the problem was is that she still has some instability. So you compare, and I would say, again, say that this is uh, undercorrected. That's, that's my concern. Um, I'd ask uh, folks to uh, give me their thoughts with regard to um, how they make sure that they've got their correction intraoperatively. This is a fairly unusual case, but uh, there's some folks with some experience on the faculty. So thoughts? Tim or Keith? I think it looks beautiful. Um, uh, a courageous reconstruction, uh, to be sure. What was the bone quality like? Uh, was it, I mean, we've all shared some concern with uh, what the bone quality would be like. Um, it, it was fair. It, it was not, uh, it was uh, not bad, but not uh, certainly not uh, the best. So in the articular cartilage, all came up as just one block. Yeah. yeah. Looks nice. So do you have any information about the soft tissues of this knee? Uh, have you done any fluoroscopic exam under anesthesia to assess medial collateral ligament and, and the peripheral ligaments of this knee? No, I didn't. And I think that the, uh, uh, that's uh, um, something that is, should have been uh, considered. You know, I thought that the residual instability, because you can see on the medial side, she's still open. Uh, I think that's uh, so, and I, I think that reflects probably uh, under correction of the medial side. And I thought that uh, it would be hard to discern what was uh, attributable to the MCL as opposed to the bone. As it, in this situation, I think the bone is, um, is still displaced and that would give you information which uh, might, not be, might not be as valuable. What are your thoughts, Mauricio? No, I'm just saying uh, it's a beautiful case very complicated case, so thanks for sharing this. Um, the problem is that um, if, you, if you go to the back, to the beginning, as you see in the preoperative picture, um, that you, you had it there, uh, basically uh, it's a bicondylar fracture that was treated with a lateral plate. So in, in what's going on here is that we are trying to address a pathology which is more comprehensive uh, than what looks like when they try to fix with a lateral locking plate. And, um, and the most critical thing when you deal with tibial plateaus is to restore the continuity of the rim. Uh, and by doing that, trying to contain the, uh, the rim with plates uh, as you've done with the medial and the lateral plate. The question I have is always um, how much of soft tissues disruption has been associated with this injury, which is a bicondylar tibial plateau, which is a fracture dislocation. And this is why after you do those fixations, uh, in my protocol, I always do a valgus inverse stress under fluoroscopy to make sure I'm not missing anything in terms of any kind of laxity. In this particular case also, um, as you said, it could be related to a malunion or to a, a non-anatomical reduction, although it looks great to me there. Uh, and I would say that you are able to restore the, the continuity of the rim and this is going to be a big plus, but we don't know more about the soft tissues in this case. And this could be another thing to complement the evaluation of this injury. Hey, Mike, we got a series of questions. I'm going to just read them and then you comment on any you want. One was, did you have any concerns about the meniscus or do anything to evaluate it? Another one is, how did you fix the fibular osteotomy? Uh, what hardware was used for the valgus osteotomy? Third one is, could you explain how you elevate that lateral condyle? Did you use a chisel? Did you have a hinge in the cartilage? Uh, what, uh, what, what was the lower oblique screw uh, serving for? And then uh, uh, finally, uh, how to decide when to put bone graft while using tunnel fix after osteotomy. So lots of things you can take on whatever you want of those. Okay, just with regard to uh, dealing with the, uh, mobilizing the bone, uh, always use... Um, broad flat surfaces and dealing with metaphyseal bone to avoid crushing. So the osteotomy was done. I used a laminate, a laminar spreader to start to get it going, but then using the osteotomy, um, the osteotomes to, to help lift and mobilize the, the bone. So again, broad flat surfaces. With regard to the fibular osteotomy, I never uh, performed it, so I didn't fix it. But in the past, I've fixed them uh, typically with a uh, 
uh, an anagrade uh, screw done obliquely pre-drilled prior to the osteotomy um, that you just uh, put the screw in afterwards and uh, fix it in compression. Um, with regard to uh, what does that lower, lower extremity, I'm sorry, lower oblique screw serve? Uh, it, really nothing. Usually I make smaller incision. If the plate is longer, I'm putting that screw in um, at an angle because I don't lengthen the, in, I don't increase the size of the incision. So it ends up being an oblique screw. Um, and then with regard to the meniscus, uh, I did not evaluate the meniscus. And to be honest with you, when I was fixing this lady, my thought was, let me at least get her solid fixation, real, realign something. And then it, cause she, she was told that she needed a, a, a total knee and she had in her mind that she needed a total knee. And I had thought, well, let's at least get solid bone stock for a total knee. It, and, um, um, so I, she actually traveled uh, in uh, for this uh, procedure and for a follow-up. So I, I lost her at Union at five months. Um, so I, I don't know what the long-term outcome was for her, whether she ultimately got a total or not, or if she's just on, moving on with her life now with, uh, uh, with her knee the way it is now. Um, but uh, I hope I answered uh, the, the majority of the questions there. Thanks, that was great, good memory. So just briefly, you know, the uh, self-criticism, I really think that uh, this might have been uh, uh, better corrected. Um, and uh, I, I hope I did the right operation uh, for her. I, I believe so. Um, but I think the moving on to the uh, last slide, Mike. There we go. Revision ORIF, osteotomy is a potential salvage in these cases. Overcorrection is unlikely. So uh, I think next time I would try and uh, really consider that. Um, thanks for your attention. Thanks, great case, Mike. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we're gonna move on and what I'm gonna do is try to get to the uh, end here real fast. We have a lot of cases to discuss. I should have put a link in, but I didn't. Um, and so we're a little over time at this point. So again, I want to point out um, that there, it is possible to access, I've showed this many times, going to the AO Trauma North America website, uh, sorry, YouTube channel and going to the osteotomy course where you can review all of the uh, uh, YouTube videos for the entire year. We've also uh, placed uh, how to put blade plates into the, this at, at this time. And so, um, Real quick, uh, can you guys see my screen? Uh, the good people who can talk. Is it going to the uh, YouTube screen? Yes. yes. So you, again, here's the AO Trauma North America. Go to playlists. And when you go to playlists, you can look at the osteotomy course playlist. And here's blade plate videos you asked. We tried to accommodate. We have all these different blade plate videos on how to insert blade plates now that are up on our YouTube channel in the osteotomy course. Um, remember to subscribe and follow because it helps with the other people looking for it. Again, which week we're on uh, is also there. So uh, I encourage you to use this as a resource um, for, uh, for that. Um, join us for Thursday and meet the experts. It's gonna be at eight o'clock uh, Eastern time. Uh, you know, we would love you for you to send in your participant cases. That's what's it intended to be. Maybe you need help on a case not done yet and you want somebody's opinion. Maybe you want to show us what you did and want some constructive criticism or us to pat you on your back for doing a great job. Most of what we have seen has been great. You can send your cases to the webmaster at AONA.org. If you're having problems because the file is just too big and you're unable to get it in, just send me an email directly and I'll figure out a way to get it in. So I encourage you to send in your cases. I think this is a unique opportunity. You heard today some of the what I would consider the world's experts. We didn't even tap half of what they have in their head to uh, learn how to do these cases. Remember next Sunday, June 13th, we're going to be uh, our final lecture set, but we'll have one more discussion group. On diaphyseal distal tibia, we're going to hear Mitch, and he's going to go over some bone transport and dealing with bone loss. We're going to have Sean Nork talk about the mathematically directed osteotomy and indications to treat malunions. Tim is going to be back with distal extraarticular deformities of the tibia. 
and we're going to have uh, another one of the world experts, uh, Steve Benershka, talk to us about uh, distal intraarticular uh, deformity and osteotomies. So I want to thank everyone for their time. Please keep in mind, we have some questions that are going to be coming up from uh, Angel, and I really uh, hope that you uh, do our poll. Uh, send me any of your comments. It's really important that we get your feedback in order to try to improve this course. So thanks again. Thanks, uh, all of the uh, faculty. You guys were terrific. Um, I wish I knew half of what you know. Thanks again.